and they get better every time. I told them the other day, I said, you should have been a pastor. Mm. I said, you'd be twice the pastor I could ever be. Dad loves people. God's put that in his heart. I want you to know that um, they don't train you in ministry school how to do your mother's funeral. Mm. So we've never been this way before. But I want to read a scripture. My son, Drew, he read it earlier, but I want to come back to it. It's Revelation 21. It's the end of the book. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I want you to think about this. Right now, heaven is located up above, but there's coming a day where God is going to bring heaven down to this earth. I don't know if I can understand why he's going to do that, but I might have a little idea when my son went to college. He attends Grove City College about three hours away and plays there on the football team. Every chance that we can get, my wife and I, and the girls and Matthew, we'll get in the car and we'll go to Grove City. And when I get there, you know, I'm, I'm a former football coach. I look at that campus and I want to coach there. I want to live in Grove City. <laughs> but it's not because they have the crimson u uniforms like Alabama. It's not because they have a beautiful campus and they do a beautiful field. It's because you want to be close to your son. That's the heart of God, friend. That's why one day he's going to bring heaven down to this earth. And when you think that through, he created us from the dust of the ground. We're going to lay mom's body in a short time in the ground. From dust we came, from dust we'll return. But the spirit lives forever. Amen. And man, when God created him, he created Adam. And then he created Eve because he didn't want Adam to be alone. It was never meant for mom and dad to be separated by death. That was not God's plan. Mm. But we messed it up, didn't we? We sinned. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. We are here today to say goodbye to mom because of death. It's the wage of sin. I saw a statistic the other day and statistic said, one out of one people die. <laughs> Do you realize that that if the Lord tarries, I don't think he will, but if he does, there will come a moment that you will be in that casket. I will be in that casket. We have to think about what will they say about us. Man sinned on the earth. But God had a plan in 2,000 years ago. He didn't shout it from heaven. Hey, I love you guys down there. He didn't come up with a program, a 10-step program on how to be healed of this sin disease. No, God had a plan for the Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in Jesus shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God's plan was the cross. The only way that we can be redeemed, I don't mean to offend you, but Roman Catholicism cannot save you. The Baptist denomination cannot save you. The four square Pentecostal holiness. Do you realize when Jesus walked the earth, there were no denominations. There was no Catholic or Protestant. There was only two groups. You were either a Jew or you were a Gentile. The Bible says 
Yes, salvation is of the Jews. <clears throat> but when Jesus died on the cross, he died for the whole world. And you don't have to become a Jew to get saved. You have to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And when he died on that cross, Jesus said these words, the three most powerful words as it pertains to man in the whole Bible, and the devil has not gotten over it yet. Mm -hmm. Jesus, as he hung there and died before he gave up his spirit, he said, it is finished. And in the Greek, it's a word called teleos, teleos, and it means paid in full. Mm -hmm. And I want to tell you, there came a day when that revelation came to mom, it came to dad, it came to our family, that we didn't have to join a church to be saved. We didn't have to give a certain amount of money. We didn't have to rub beads together day after day or pray to a statue. You know, we had to admit we were a sinner and we were separated from God and put our faith in the one who died on that cross and believe that his blood is the only payment by which God the Father will accept as the ransom for our soul. Amen. Karen shared it. When God said, go home. The Chori family began to change. I remember the day when she walked through the door. I watched it. I watched mom answer the door. <clears throat> I watched dad put his arms around Karen. I had no idea that that was the beginning, that when God said for Karen to go home, it had a practical meaning, but it had even a bigger meaning, spiritual. God was saying to our family, I want you to go home. And where is home, God? Home is in the arms of your Savior. And those of you today that are here, if Jesus Christ does not live in your heart, I don't have to say this, you know there is a loneliness within your spirit and soul that you cannot shake. Oh, we try by ambition, we try by athletics, we try by, by jobs and relationships, but when your head hits that pillow, if Jesus is not in your heart, <clears throat> you could say it better than I, there is an emptiness. Mm -hmm. I want you to know the last 13 days now it's 16 days, have been the most life-changing days of my life. See, when mom got sick and she was admitted into the hospital on October the 29th, and I heard she was in ICU, there was something that welled up on the inside of me that I felt like this is the time that God's going to call mom home. The moment that we had all feared and I knew that God said, I want you to put everything aside and I want you to, to be there until I call her home. And for 13 days, Linda and Karen, dad and me, we lived at Sister's Hospital day and night. There was a particular moment that we were there for 33 straight hours because we wanted to be there when God took her home. I said to dad, I want to shout her through. I want to shout her to the other side. Because you see, when mom walked an altar with dad in 1981, it was at the chapel on North Forest Road. And Dr. Andrews was the pastor. And when they came to Christ, their lives changed. Karen had already dedicated her life to Jesus. Linda wasn't far behind but I, that was okay for me. But when mom and dad did it, I was outnumbered in the house. <laughs> and I mean, when mom got saved, she became a fanatic for Jesus Christ. She began to read her Bible. And she would many nights be up to three, four in the morning. And she would mark her Bible and underline her Bible. And she would be writing and writing. As a young 18-year-old, I never saw this before. They would begin to play the Christian music in the house. And I said to mom one day, I said, mom, I know we've always believed in Jesus, but this is getting a little carried out. This is getting a lot of hand here. And I can remember going up into my bedroom. It's going to sound funny to you now that, you know, we're in the ministry now, me and my wife, but I would turn on my music 
Rick James, super freaky. We're super freaky. To try to drown out the Christian song. But my mother did something that was so significant that I would give every mother here to do for your children. She prayed this prayer. She said, God, I pray that Michael will fail at everything his hand finds to do until he bends his knee and gives his life to you. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to tell you, God answered that prayer. And for six months, I failed at everything I did. It came to the point that it was so bad, I couldn't win a card game or a pool game. I could not win anything. And I reached this point and I said this out loud. I said, I feel like the biggest loser and it was like I heard God say in my heart, I've been waiting for you to admit that for 18 years. <clears throat> and on March 28, 1982, I gave my heart and life to Christ under the ministry of Dr. Andrews. And mom gave me my first Bible, which I'm reading from today. This is the first Bible. We've been through a lot of Bibles. My mother-in-law works at a Bible store, so I was blessed. But mom wrote, or she stuck a magnet on this Bible and it says this, God will answer prayer. Amen. And yesterday at the wake, they had said to us when everybody had gone home and it was only my dad and me and my, my sisters and our immediate family that before we said our last goodbye and they closed the casket, if you wanted to leave something in the casket, you could do that. I had known of that a few days prior, and I, I thought to myself, what would I leave in my mom's casket? The woman who led me to Jesus, the woman who gave me my first Bible, the woman that would go into her bedroom, which used to be my bedroom, or, or, or my bedroom became her prayer closet, I should say. She would go into my former bedroom and make it her prayer closet, and she would pray for my wife, she would pray for my children, she would specifically pray for Matthew to be healed. She had a burden. She prayed for all of us. What can I leave her? And then God gave me the idea. We were just recently in the Holy Land in Israel. And we went to the Valley of Eli. It is the valley in the Bible where David defeated Goliath. And there in that valley just a few weeks ago, I reached down on the ground and I picked up five rocks. David had five in his pouch that day when he fought Goliath. But he would only need one because the rock represented and symbolized Christ. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we all drank from the same spiritual rock and the rock is Christ. And I said, I'm going to take one of those rocks and I'm going to put it in the casket. Because it symbolizes for me and symbolizes for you that this giant that we face in life is too big for us. Mom's giant was sickness. It was too big for mom. In 40 years, she wandered in the wilderness of sickness until God said, enough, I'm taking you now to the promised land. And last night, me and my dad as we knelt before the casket to say goodbye one last time, I pulled out that rock out of my pocket, a smooth stone. And I said, Dad, this rock represents to me the giant will fall. And when Mom prayed me into the kingdom of God, that giant of living for self, that giant of unbelief and running around life trying to figure it all out, when mom prayed me into the kingdom, when I asked Jesus Christ to come into my life, I'm going to tell you the God's honest truth, the giant fell that day. Mm. And I have learned I need that rock every day. Because if I put that rock down and start fighting my own battles, you know what? I can go right back to where I was. Paul said it this way. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are saved, it is the power of God. He said in 1 Corinthians 2 and 2, For I have determined not to know anything else but Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
Paul said, we preach Christ crucified, buried, and risen from the dead because it was on that day, that rainy day on Calvary's hill, that when the devil thought he had won, Jesus had a plan. He died so that we could be free. Amen. And three days later, proving that what he offered on Calvary, God the Father accepted, he came out of that tomb. Oh, the victory is the cross of Calvary. Nothing in my hands I bring. Nothing in mom's hands she would bring but the cross of Calvary. Last night I said, Dad, I know that mom prayed from Matthew all the time. And I have a sneaky feeling she's up there interceding with the master. She would do it something like this after she's worshiped and she might wait for a good moment and she'd say, a master, could I have a moment with you please? And the Lord would say, most certainly, Carolyn. I was wondering if you might send one down, a healing miracle down to my grandson. I wonder if he could do that. Ooh. Last night I said to dad, where do I put the rock? I was just gonna lay it in the casket and dad says, I know. Mom had her hands like this. And I don't know how, but I know it was the Lord. There was an opening underneath her hands between her body and her hands. And we slipped that rock right underneath her hands. Because you see, Carolyn Shorey, my mom's claim to fame, was in my bedroom on her knees praying. And God heard her. For eight and a half months, she prayed her last grandchild would have red hair. When Emma came out with red hair, I said to mom, I said, Mom, I got a few other things I'd like you to pray about. <laughs> I'm going to close with this story of, of mom. Dad said she was strong. One time, I heard a thump upstairs. I said, what was that? And I heard dad, you know, start to yell. We all ran upstairs, and in the hallway, there was a big hole in the wall. Dad aggravated her so much, she threw a right hook. Dad ducked, and put a, she put a hole in the wall. <laughs> I want you to know, I did not see that very often, although she did throw a chicken bone one time and hit me in the chest. I said, why did you do that? We have some amazing memories of our BC days before Christ. But I could not understand, Lord, why? 13 days struggling in the hospital. Lord, why don't you just take her? She's suffering. I would come home and and I would weep at 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock. I would cry out to God. I would say, Lord, I don't understand. She's saved. But we have to remember the cross is a terrible suffering. We enter into his sufferings. But then the Lord showed me something. She went home on Tuesday, November 10. All through high school and all through my college life, my number was 10. It meant something to me. She was in room seven, bed 17, went in on the 29th, died on the 10th. But the day before she went home to be with the Lord, we were in the waiting room and Linda was there and it was me and there was one other lady, an African-American girl on the other side of the waiting room. And all of a sudden, this lady just burst into tears and buried her head into her jacket and my sister who has my mother's compassionate heart did not wait long and she made a beeline over to that dear lady and put her arms around her and began to minister love. Mm -hmm. And the woman then opened up to my sister on, on all her problems in life and her mother is in ICU and she's an only child and she's been diagnosed, she herself, with MS. And Linda looked over at me, Mike, you need to come over. And I came over to her and when I began to minister to her the gospel message that I'm trying to minister to you today, this young girl said these words. She said, I'm so confused. She said, I'm in my 40s, but I feel like a child in my thinking. I'm confused by denominations. I just became a Catholic Christian. I've, I've read the Quran. I've read the Bible, but I just don't understand. And I asked the young girl what her name was, and she said her name was Bobby. 
And I said, Bobby, has there ever been a moment in your life where you have repented of your sins and invited Jesus Christ to come in? She looked at me, she says, oh yeah, I've done that before. And I said, has there been ever been a time then, Bobby, in your life where you have made Jesus Lord of your life? Mm-hmm. She blinked at me, she looked, she says, I've never even heard of that terminology. Mm-hmm. How many of you know if Jesus Christ is not Lord of all, Amen. then he's not really Lord at all. Amen. He was Lord of all of mine. Yes. And this family, when we gave our heart to Jesus, Totally not perfect, still not perfect, but we're all in because Jesus is real. She looked at me. She said, I've never done that. I said, Bobby, would you like to do that? She said, I would like to do that. I said, then we can pray right now. And this woman took off her jacket, reached with both hands, one to Linda, one to me, and said, then let's pray. And we led her in the sinner's prayer, and she prayed and repented of her sins, and she made Jesus Christ Lord of her life. When it was over, I couldn't get back fast enough into mom's room, into room seven, where we had been for 12 days and 12 nights. And I said, mom, and she was now in such a weakened state, she could not open her eyes, she could not speak. But I began to tell her, mom, now I know why you've been in this hospital for 12 days and the Lord hasn't taken you yet, mom, because we just met a young girl who said she didn't want to go to hell. And we just led her to Jesus Christ, mom, in her Weakness began to moan. Her eyebrows began to go up. Because mom loved to see people come to Jesus Christ. And if she was here this morning, she would say to me, Michael, give them an opportunity to receive Jesus. Because as I prayed for you on earth, I am now in heaven praying for them to make Jesus Christ Lord of their life. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes as the worship team comes back. I want to pray this prayer that I prayed with Bobby Finney, this young girl just a few days ago. It's a simple prayer, but it's one that if you say it and you mean it with all of your heart, God will change your life and he will change your eternity. Let's pray. And I would just invite you to pray it right where you're sitting. In your heart, God can hear your heart. Pray it after me, will you? Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. And I admit to you that I am a sinner. And I cannot save myself. I am sorry for my sins. I know they have hurt you and hurt others, and they have hurt me. And today I want to repent. I want to turn my life over to you, Jesus. I invite you to be the Lord of my life. I ask you for a home in heaven. And today I trust in the shed blood of Jesus Christ to be my only ticket into heaven. And right now, according to your word, which cannot lie, Romans chapter 10, I confess with my mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. And I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. And he's alive. And right now, in this very moment, I ask you to be alive in me. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to just ask the team to sing a simple chorus one time. As we're singing this song one time, if you just pray to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Maybe some of you came back to the Lord just a moment ago. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet and sing this to God as your way of thanking him for the miracle of salvation.
as they sing, if you just pray, just stand and sing it with us, won't you? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but Before you ever came here, I want you to stay.